So we're here at Kutimbo, up on this mesa, not too far from Lake Titicaca. These are some of the amazing round and square chulpa towers, supposedly built by the Koya people around 1100 AD onwards, but there's a lot of evidence here that they could be influenced by the Tiwanakans, the Pakura culture, and even uh, the Inca. So, um, we, as you can see in the style of the puffy polygonal stonework, but we were here last year with Freddie Silver and we were doing some toning in here, and the whole place kind of, just became like this acoustic resonance chamber so there could be some sort of secret hidden uh, qualities to the site uh, regarding acoustics also you can see um, in the, on the upper levels we'll, we'll take a closer look in a minute there's some redstone which is more sort of vol volcanic whereas the other stone is much harder kind of basalt or andesite a much tougher looking stone which we find all around this area so it's a very interesting site very similar to Silistani and we're going to take a closer look at some of these incredible relief carvings which to me look just like they should be at Gebekli Tepe um, in Turkey which is very strange and does suggest there could be either a common origin or a very similar very you know synchronistic style here just coincidentally but either way uh, let's go and take a closer look so just behind me here are the two very famous carvings from Katimbo we have uh, the puma and also we have what looks like either a monkey or a puma emerging from the rock we also have a second puma over on the other side there and this is what really has grabbed my attention the first time i came here because of the similarities to gobekli tepe and this is something that also graham hancock has noted brian forrester david childers and other authors so it does suggest that this high technology of relief carving not only existed here in peru but also in turkey most likely earlier in turkey but somehow the influence reached this part of the world or it was just a pure coincidence or synchronicity but definitely worth checking out if you come to Peru this site called Kutimbo around the edge of Lake Titicaca. Well conventional archaeology calls all of these chulpas funeral towers that they were built to bury some important person but they are so complex in their composition the external layer is basalt and we don't know where the basalt exactly comes from. And the interior is more of a diorite material, which we'll see more specifically at Silustani, where one of them is badly damaged on one side, so we see the actual cross-section of it. And that's where it gets, Silustani and that tower is really interesting, because you know we, we see how it was built. There's also clay that was incorporated into the diorite, which is white, and it's not from this area. So whoever was doing this, this work was building some kind of resonance structure and then something happened to them. Later on other people come in and they, f they find them empty so of course they say, well, King so-and-so is dead, why don't we bury him here? And then later they start to cons construct their own ones but they're, little t they're much smaller, much cruder and not tightly fitting like these ones are. So it's another example of where history's gone backwards. They say the first people came, they built these really simple ones, and then the Inca come, and because the Inca built the Coricancha in Cusco <coughs> of tight-fitting stones, they must have built these too. It's all supposition. So behind me you can just see one of the great ramps. This is like a stone ramp. Uh, it curves around and goes towards the top of the chulpa. Now it's been said this is probably the construction technique they use to make it. But when you actually go inside the chulpa, especially the big square one, you find that it's got incredible um, sort of leaning in ceiling. But the stones also get bigger the further up they go. So it's a very interesting technique. It's different to other sites we've seen, um, but it is one of the traditional techniques of the chulpas, which we do find also at Silistani. So we'll have a closer look at the techniques as we sort of go around the site. But these long ramps sort of fascinate me, the fact that they've been left here um, as part of probably the procession that they did when uh, the burials, these are said to be burial chambers. Um, who built them? Again, we don't know, but we know they've been reused over and over again so it gets, it gets a little bit confusing trying to work out actually who built these sites.
So here we have what looks like a badly weathered llama. And below it, obviously, we have the protruding sort of coming at you. It looks like a puma or some kind of animal. And I'm sure that's a llama that's been very badly weathered. And on that one, I'm sure there's something on there as well. Just trying to work out what they are. And this one here. That's a monkey. That's not a llama. Okay, I've just been pointed out by a very sensible person that this is a monkey, and not a llama. <laughs> just down behind me, there's another example of like a 3D puma sort of emerging out of the rock coming towards you. This is also on the main Chulpa Tower, just around the other side next to the square tower. And, uh, and also next to it, just up here, I'll uh, get some close-ups in a second. You can actually see what looks like some kind of creature. Uh, it could be some kind of llama or puma. Let's, let's get in there and get, zoom in a little bit and take a closer look. Just around the darkened, shady edge of this particular Chulpa Tower, we see another puma carving up on this rock. And something below it as well. It could be a serpent. So we have this one down here, and then this one is now just lighting up. Just at the top here. This thing might be something. But this one here is fascinating because it's actually lighting up as we witness it and watch it. Yeah. Obviously the one on the left is fully lit with the sunlight so you can barely see it, it's almost bleached out. But the one on the right, the shadow's just coming around now. So it actually stands out and produces an effect. Yeah, it could be like, an, you know, just showing the difference you know, from the morning and the afternoon because it's around 11, 30, 12 o'clock now. Very interesting. I wonder if this was part of the design. It was just like a solar clock, just on the outside of the chambers. As we've seen outside on the other round chopper, we have uh, Gebekli Tepe style carvings um, of what appear to be a feline, most likely a puma, um, which is almost identical not only to um, the carved art at Gebekli Tepe, but also similar to what we saw um, at the little village of Waro. Um, a few days ago where there were many blocks that have been found locally that show serpents and spirals and whatever and we found a possible connection between this and the Pokhara culture and I didn't honestly know much about the Pokhara culture but I was told that they are on the edge of uh, Lake Titicaca on the area of it and as we passed through the Pokhara area yesterday we see of course this, this huge um, mountain, um, well carved, but in the simulacra of um, of a puma, and apparently this was you know well known by the local people, probably why they settled in that area. Um, and then here we find that these pumas are almost identical to other a pair of pumas that were on a little at Waro. So I sense that there's a very strong link between this site and not only the the Waro area, uh, obviously very close to Cusco, but also um, to Pacara as well, they're all somehow interlinked. Presumably some kind of uh, culture that existed before the Inca, which is quite incredible because the type and style of architecture here is almost identical to what we see in Cusco. You know, Saxi Woman, um, obviously at, at, um, also at Machu Picchu, um, and you know, obviously the various other sites that, that are all accredited to the Inca, um, you know, quite clearly they're pre-Inca in a way, if indeed these structures do predate the Inca period, as has been suggested by historians of the region. So we've been trying to obviously uh, work out what's going on inside. There's some kind of acoustic property involved with this. The exact purpose of these chalpas remains um, obscure. They could have been uh, granaries, uh, possibly to store grain over uh, a period, uh, perhaps away from any kind of marauding or whatever, or maybe there was some, um, you know, supernatural reason why they felt that, that, that um, the grain had to be put here. But that's just a theory. 
who knows what these were uh, made for. And I look forward to seeing you know, further uh, carvings that seem to relate to Quebec de Tepe. I said if you take two of those stones in that pot, that smaller pile yeah. and tap them together, yeah. they sing. So they, that they vibrate much more easily than the basalt does. So, and also they, they're domed inside. Um, it's like a, like a beehive. Mm -hmm. So the one that tapers out like this, the interior, you can, if you pay the guy, you can go inside. But it's quite large. You can stand up in it. And then there's this beehive shape that's over top of it and this really fine clay which was which was in um, which was which filled the whole thing in as well like almost like an insulating layer it's you know you're looking at some kind of energetic thing going on of a level of technology again that we just don't understand you know they look simple but when they were actually functioning they may have been really profound and that's why some people who believed that the Great Pyramid was a, a vibratory thing. There's no way you could be inside that thing when it was on. Because right now it's running at about one hundredth of one percent of what it used to do. And that's why people meditate, because they go inside there and it's like, whoa, this feels good. But if it was an energetic machine with water running underneath it and, and powering that thing, then it's possible that it, it was not only the interior was resonating, but it, but that it was also the, the resonance was actually moving from all four sides out and creating, like an energetic field around it. That's one one theory. One of the other things uh, we've noticed at the site here as well is this red volcanic rock, which forms the top layer of the square chulpa. This is particularly interesting because you find exactly the same thing in Easter Island on the top knots of the Moai. And so if there's a connection there, if there's some energetic principle at play, which is most likely because these towers here, uh, it was reported, to, Brian spoke to an elder uh, of the area who told him that the towers, the, when they, they were round, the round towers especially, seeds were deliberately placed in them because it would preserve the seeds and it would charge them up and create a better facility for creating a better crop, uh, a more robust crop. And this is exactly the same technology we've been talking about with John Burke and others. This is changing direction. Is changing direction? Oh my God. That's changed by about 20, 20 or 30 degrees. Yeah. And oh. then, then it's opposite. That is very strange. Well, actually not so strange, because th these are uh, volcanic rocks. And uh, they go through the Curie point of some 550 degree as they come to the surface. And then it depends uh, which direction you put the stone into the building. It could be this way or that way, the nat natural magnetic property or that one. Right, this circle here. Um, this is clearly not a uh, collapsed building because there's just not enough uh, blocks that, have, that are laying about now. This has been created deliberately, just a few courses high, circle of what, about um, about 12 to 15 metres um, uh, in, in size and in this direction here, which uh, is what are we talking about, the east, sort of the west, to, would that be the southwest I'm not sure I'll check that um, you've got like this little small wall here which could almost be seen as like an altar um, you know perhaps even reflecting the position where almost south well that's interesting because I mean I'm not saying that it is but these long flat altar like um, areas are found in megalithic structures uh, in Scotland for instance where they were used to um, to, to monitor the, the 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 path of the moon at the time of the um, lunar standstill cycle, you know, at the time when it would be seen to roll across the landscape, and those altars would be in the south. Um, the other possibility is that this is there to focus upon the stars of the southern sky. Obviously, that the the the, the celestial pole and the circumpolar stars that revolve around that, probably including. Uh, the Southern Cross. So 
that would be my first thought. I mean, to me, that this has all of the indications of being a, a ritual site. And apparently, this isn't the only one. There's another one, even larger, close by, which we're going to look at now. So let's have a look and see if we can compare them. Here we have an even larger stone circle, just made of uh, blocks of stone that have been uh, piled to make a, a, a circular wall, like a perimeter. Um, this one is probably just slightly larger, so maybe 20 meters across. We could uh, measure it before we go. But it seems to be focused, as uh, Megan here is pointing out, that uh, the uh, sandwich came up here earlier, that it's focused around a large natural rock in the centre, which it clearly is. Um, and that from here, you can see smaller uh, circles of stone um, that seem to be placed actually within the, the larger one. This is not absolute evidence of, of a settlement. To me, this has a ritualistic function. No, right, this seems to be almost like a, a rock cairn in exactly the same position as what the altar was over there. It faces towards the south and that does indicate obviously a, an interest in that particular area of the sky. But um, there was a, quite a large structure here. Um, and it's almost, it's oval, it's almost boat shaped in a way. These are actually directed towards the north, um, or some aspect of it. I mean, we'll obviously try and check this uh, before we go, but this is a very interesting structure because this is, this is like a, a, like a boat. It's shaped like a, a small boat. I mean, you know, it seems to have had courses of, of, of rock shaped into this elliptical or oval shape which reminds me immediately of the so-called oval of Viracocha, which is one of the primary symbols shown within the Incan altar found at the Coricancha. And the fact that it, it has this presence so close to this stone circle, I think that this is some kind of ritualistic place. here just at this part of the corner just after midday some other features coming out on the wall now for example we have the serpents we've seen already but this feature here is very interesting and this one here whether these are deliberate design looks like a man on a horse there this great serpent whatever it is has just emerged and look at the shadow coming off the protrusion there it's almost like pointing to something at midday more or less on the winter solstice there are some features on here it looks like some kind of striations we actually saw and Cusco and at Oriente Tambo and at Machu Picchu only can be seen when the light is correct and this is what it is now so this is the same technology we're seeing all these different sites including Katimbo. Look at this stone here, this is absolutely fascinating. Let's see if there's any other features. Obviously we have the serpent up there. There's some kind of carvings here. I think we can pretty much conclude from our visit here to Kutimbo around the winter solstice, uh, June 2015, that we've actually witnessed the sun move around. Um, and what's happening is, especially around leading up to midday and going past midday, we're finding that the serpents and other carvings, uh, relief carvings protruding from the wall, are actually revealing themselves to us as we wait and watch the sun move round, so it lights them up, so it illuminates them. So it's like the illumination is bringing out the wisdom and the knowledge. And I believe there's evidence now of some kind of solar clock. Here at Kutimbo, most definitely at Sulastani, what's left of it, and quite probably in Cusco as well, and at Machu Picchu and other sites. And these carvings and these knobs actually point us to the times of day, to the times of year, and they could represent some kind of shamanic uh, tool um, to like trigger kind of knowledge and where people would be, there'd be teachings going on here um, while this is happening. So I think it's just fascinating that 
the ancients who built this, whoever they were, deliberately left these codes and this kind of solar clock, I'm going to call it from now on, at these sites. And it's just a real treat to be able to witness these ourselves. And um, if you join us um, in the future, we'll come back here and we'll try and time it so we can see this light phenomena happening around the stones of Kutimbo.